Hi, everyone. This is Martin Pitella for Life Enthusiast Podcast. And with me today, Ramania Dean Damas. From Hi. Hey, Martin. Hey, RDT Herbs, my favorite traditional Chinese tonics herbalist. It's a whole lot of words, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah but it, it, it's, it's, uh, it fits the purpose. So <laughs> I, I want to say we, we don't mention it enough. Right. Like there, those those words that I just said actually pack a whole lot of impact that should be known. <laughs> One is herbs. Herbs, yes. are, <laughs> herbs are concentrators and they yes. represent to us the terroir, the terrain they grow up in. So yes. I would like you to speak on that for a bit. And then the second part is the tonic, which is which do you pick? And how do you mix it, right? Yeah. So let, let's well, cover some of that so people get it in their heads as they're listening to it, why this actually matters. Thanks, Martin. It's a pretty loaded question, though. <laughs> Don't oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do we call it an herb and why do we call food food? Why do we classify them differently, right? Well, because food is very easily digested and assimilated in our digestive system. And what we're looking for in food is your, you know, your enzymes, the various minerals and vitamins. Um, a, a tomato grows over a couple of months. And in that time, it has gathered a certain amount of what we call chi out of the atmosphere and out of the sun. And it is a concentrated unit, a storage unit of sunlight of that chi. And then when we eat that, our digestive systems are designed, we have about a 24-hour turnaround before we excrete the food that we've eaten. So we have a short uh, a time span to get those nutrients out. And so the most efficient foods for us to eat are soft, succulent vegetables and fruits. And, uh, and th because those uh, elements are broken down very easily with our digestive enzymes and the nutrients are drawn into the blood, usually uh, in, in the, in the uh, splenic arteries, the nutrients are drawn into the blood and we call that hemoglobin. And then it's burned is what we call ATP. So that's producing our daily energy is, is what we eat. Uh, how much sunlight is in what you're eating? That's an important equation, right? Yeah. Well, why do we classify uh, uh, herbs as a different in, in, with a different name? The reason because an herb is uh, not hasn't been growing for only two months. It's been growing sometimes for years and years. And in that process, this plant has to develop uh, certain kinds of resilience to, to survive in nature, uh, whereas the tomato plant's going to die back in the fall, um, our little herb is going to keep growing. And what happens is uh, genetics come in that create proteins in its, its stem uh, called lignin, which is like bark. And then uh, now the, the, whatever nutrients this plant contains are locked inside this bark. And because this plant has to keep living in uh, over seasons, now it's going to have to endure cold, hot, rain, snows, all that. The plant develops more complex. Well, it already has, has developed more complex genetics in order to evolve, in order to uh, survive and adapt to all of those changing elements. But it also has to develop different kinds of complex internal uh, phytochemistry in order to protect itself from invasive organisms. So it protects uh, antibiotic type properties. It protects uh, properties to, to help it uh, flux like nerve being taught properties. And, and, um, and so the, the, it, it develops uh, what we consider to be uh, natural, uh, yeah, we could call them uh, you know, medicinal properties, but they're locked in now and they're very complex. Whereas the, 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 the polysaccharide in a, in a tomato is pretty simple. But the polysaccharide in, a, in an herb maybe have, have 10 syllables in it, you know, because it's so complex. But we have to unlock it now. And what happens is sometime a long time ago, we really can thank the ancient peoples uh, around the world for finding out that if they took that piece of wood and they boiled it and they could unlock the, 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 the tea, we call it, out. And that tea still contains some of those properties. Now, on that equation, I ask people, well, aren't we killing things when we cook it? Because we have a lot of raw foodists that I've worked with over the years. And the answer is, uh, we're looking for our living enzymes in that tomato. 
But when we're going to get our, our, our herbs and boil that or steep it and, and steep out the, or, or decoct out the primary constituents with alcohol or apple cider vinegar or whatever it is we do, uh, those constituents are found to survive. And that's because they have what we call extremophilic uh, properties. That is, they can survive that boiling. And that's why they become so important in our health. They are adaptable to that to those extremes. So those nutrients that survive those extremes can be traced back to the early uh, life that came onto Earth, stuff that, land, that came in here on meteorites and frozen in ice and dust that blew through the atmosphere for billions of years before it got here. All those are extremophilic uh, organisms or life forms um, and metabolites. And when they mix, all of this has happened. And uh, the plants today still hold some of that. Now, we humans don't necessarily have to adapt to the extremes anymore because we've built these artificial environments. But we're having to adapt to other kinds of extremes now, like stress, which we weren't really designed to constantly re react to. And these, they're, they've found... So, Romania, as you're talking, I'm reminded of three important things. One is the environment in which this thing grows. Yeah. And you mentioned it. It's the summer, winter, so the heat and the mm -hmm. dry and the wet and the cold and all of these seasons are actually pressing on the plant. And in yeah. its a, attempt to survive, it has to develop resilience. And this resilience yeah. is stored in those cells. And so when yeah. we extract it out, we're actually borrowing or taking away from the plant the resilience yeah. that it collected. Mm -hmm. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's not just a chlorophyll or not just a unit of sugar that that i'm picking up that's that's calories that's easy the resilience yeah that's hard that's what's dealing with <laughs> energies of survival as opposed to uh, energies yeah. making it day to day uh when we unlock those properties uh we have to we have to unlock them out of the plant. That's why an herb has to usually be decocted or prepared in some way or another. And so, yeah, you mentioned that we we can boil it. That's the most common way in water. And we need heat mm -hmm. because we really need to work it. And of course, when we're yes. dealing with those woody things like the stems and the roots and uh, all that woody part of the plant, yeah. it really does not want to let go of yeah. what it collected. So we need to torture yeah. it. We need to torture yeah. it to get it out. Yeah, <laughs> that's part of its extremophilic nature. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's where the uh, you, you mentioned the raw food is dilemma. Raw yeah. food is great, mm -hmm. and it provides mm -hmm. us with enzymes, which mm -hmm. is where digesting of things is happening. Yeah. But in the case of tonics digestion's not really involved. We're going for absorption of availability of nutrients, right? Exactly, exactly. It's it's very important to help that stuff just get right into the bloodstream through the pre-processing pre it so that we don't, our bodies don't have to extend, expend energy trying to digest a piece of bark. Right. So this is where herbal teas, but especially tonic teas, all of a sudden take on a new life, a new meaning. Yeah. It's just that... Yeah. No, we're not doing it just for the pleasure of it. We're actually doing it for the value of it. Exactly. We're not doing something to try and create some kind of proprietary process, you know, in order to profit off something like that. It's it's a it's a requirement to unlock these nutrients and make them bioavailable to the body. And it's an excellent science that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years around the world. And so what's interesting about the the sources that you use, the plants that you use in yours, is uh, that they have grown in really harsh climates, right? Well, yeah, um, particularly the herbs we call adaptogens. And everyone's been hearing that term. Um, I, I, I'd like to take a moment with you during this talk, a few moments here and there, to kind of clarify exactly what that is. But yes, an adaptogenic herb uh, is one that it, it had to live in a very harsh place, and it, it had to adapt to its environment. And then when we look at it, we find multiple sets of RNA and DNA. And we find tons and tons of, of uh, protective and adaptive phytochemistry there that doesn't exist in the little tomato that only lived for two months. Right on. 
Yeah, well, if you and take the word apart, gen, as in genesis or creation, and yeah. adapta adaptability is it creates adaptation in us. That's what the adapter gen is. That's why we call it that. But uh -huh. the reason um, it can give it to us is because it had to create it for itself. It did, right. And it's quite um, fascinating that this new uh, field of nutraceutical science is uh, emerging over adaptogens. And now everyone's searching for adaptogenic plants. But again, like we said, they can find them and they go to hostile places to find these plants. Particularly rhodiola rosea was the first one that was found, which grows way up in Siberia. Yeah. And the people there. Uh, the reason it was discovered was because um, the, the Russian government went to a doctor named Lazarov in 1947 and said, hey, can you figure out how these people survive in Siberia? Because our soldiers are freezing on the battlefield up there, but there's people living there and seem to do fine. So he went up there and found that they they said they were taking the well, golden root, and he took it back to Moscow. And by then they could look at phenotypes and they saw all this uh, genetics and, yeah. and uh, adapted. But the cool thing is now that he coined that term adaptogen. But the neat thing is, in our modern world, we need these plants more than ever because of stress. We, the, the human body was not actually designed to, to endure constant stress. And uh, this is wearing us down, it's making people age. Mm -hmm. um, and the adaptogenic herbs almost become this godsend that this new classification of herbs was discovered and brought to us at this time because we need it more than ever because yeah. we're multi asking we're doing we've got so much on our plate and uh so the herbs like the adaptogens become very important in our lives well, uh and many of the tonic herbs that i work with are, are are said to have adaptogenic properties yeah if you think about it the stress that the plant has to endure makes it stronger and then we yeah. borrow it from them right or acquire yeah. it and there are two ways to get stress one it's always climatic as in from climate, yeah. and you can do yeah. it either by taking it up latitude toward the polar circle, or you can take it up elevation toward the sun. So yeah, you know, like maca from Peru is yes. uh, famous for its uh, ability to feed us in in a way that metabolic systems really benefit, and mm -hmm. or or other minerals collected in high altitudes, right? Stuff like that. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Every time you learn one thing, you feel like, oh my God, I, it opens up and oh my, oh, I, I realize how little I know. But then each little thing is like a revelation, you know? <laughs> right on. So I would like to give you a chance to introduce the new products that we have yeah. not even talked about on our shows before, which, mm -hmm. which is great. And of course, you being the I don't know. Call, do you call yourself a tea master? Well, that was the title that my teacher Ron T. Garden gave to me when he first met me, and I operate. I, I acted as his tea master for eight years, and then he gave me a title, uh, a superior herbalist. But I still like to think of myself as a tea master. <laughs> and so, uh, I see this cool product that you put out recently that you call True Chai. Yes. So yeah, talk about that. Okay. Well. Um, at this point in my life, I've been working with Chinese tonic herbs, uh, very, very, very satisfied with my life with them for 24 years now, um, and still feel like I'll, I'll always have the greatest respect and learning of the, the way that these herbs were found and classified and used throughout history. But I did decide recently to spread out a little bit and start looking at India, um, looking at Ayurveda. And I had a friend who was an Ayurveda, who is an Ayurvedic master. And he once said to me, he goes, well, you know, that chai that's on the market, it's not real chai. Uh, I said, what's that? He says, well, when it's called masala chai, it's actually a, a corrupted chai that that was when the British wanted their black tea. When the British were colonizing India, they wanted their black tea. And they figured out the mixing it with chai was tasty. And they came to, kept, came up with this clever term, masala chai, which, which has the black tea that the British introduced into it. But that's not the original chai. So I said to my friend, well, what's the original one? And he sent me the recipe which has saffron and uh, cardamom and uh, uh, all kinds of beautiful uh, uh, ginger and cinnamon. And it's really, uh, if, if you looked at this recipe just on its own, you'd think it would taste really bitter and intense. But uh, I uh, mixed it according to this traditional Ayurvedic recipe that he sent me. And, and when I tasted it, uh, man, I mean, I just went, 
And when people drink it today, that one girl, a uh, young lady yesterday drank some and she said, uh, I feel like my, it just kissed my entire body. <laughs> oh, I, uh, have, uh, I have a friend who's a master with plants. She's an intuitive. Yeah. She talks to the earth. She talks yeah. to the little creatures and spirits and all of that, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. She gets to ask them, tell me where such and such is, and they will tell her. And she goes there. What? Like, what? I mean, she's really connected. Anyway, so yeah. she she was living in Nepal, in Kathmandu. Yeah. And, and she brought back from it this keto drink, mm -hmm. which she calls Kiss of Kathmandu. Wow. And, and the, the word kiss just brought that into my memory, where... yeah. All of a sudden, you are connected to the culture and to the yeah. experience, just like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So th there's your there's your wonderful blend, right? So to to unpack it, so cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg. Well, that sounds like uh, Christmas baking. I know. It's the funny thing about it is it doesn't look like anything particularly unique, but it's something about the brilliant of the combination. The brilliance of the traditional combination was probably developed over many, many, many years, centuries. And there's something about the ratios of everything in there and how they're working together that creates this synergistic effect that it does. Like you said, um, I'm reminded of the young lady you just talked about, where I felt this, the, the beautiful love in the spirit of India when I took my first sip of this stuff. Right it was just like uh, it was in the entire civilization, like an imprint. <laughs> OK, so but I'm really so how do we use this? So it's well, in a bag as a powder, right? Well, uh, what I did in keeping with my usual tradition was I was able to procure them as powdered extracts, all of the ingredients. So I, I, um, it, is, it is still a powdered extract like my other products, which means that it, it, it dilutes 100% in, in the solution immediately. There's no sediment. You don't have to filter it out. And because of that, it's a relatively small bag. I think it's a 160 gram bag um, of the powder because it's an extract. So you just use about a you know a level or slightly rounded teaspoon of it in a cup of tea. And I love to add. Um, I really like that creamy oat milk and a, a little bit of agave, um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful drink. But the, the the nice thing about it is you don't have to go through a kind of a filtering process. You know, using a steep bag or a basket or anything like that. It doesn't right. come in a little egg that you got to throw away you know yeah so this is already pre-made dry mm -hmm. ready to go mm -hmm. yes and, my with hot water and, a, and a creamer and a sweetener right yeah yeah the powdered extract process is done by the same people that do my my tonic herbal formulations and i know their process it is a it is a, a it uses the exact amount of heat and the exact amount of time that is specific for that particular uh, ingredient to get everything out of it without killing it. Um, and then it is flash dried in a, in a spinning vat into a dust. Yeah. So it's, it's all a very, very careful process to make sure that the, that the properties are still there. Yeah, that's that's important. Yeah. yeah. So great. I, I have not had a chance yeah. to try this, so I... I can't have an opinion yet, but I'm definitely looking forward to ordering it now. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Okay, so what about this? The other one that I did try, I have had a full bag of it. Uh, you call it Spirits Cheap, mm -hmm. which is, I yeah. guess, let's play uh -huh. on the word of cappuccino, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, what it is, it's a, it's a calming formula. Uh, it has reishi mushroom and lion's mane. Which uh, lion's mane is, is, of course, known to uh, to uh, support mental acuity in the brain, health of the brain, and then um, reishi is known to be uh, a kind of open heart chakra. It's known as a, a, a benevolence uh, mushroom, and uh, I added other herbs into this formula to make it uh, kind of a peaceful heart and peaceful mind, uh, and and then to create a, a kind of a coffee light drink although it tastes more mellow than coffee, but it's the same idea. And um, I, uh, you know, actually I created the concept of the mushroom coffee. That was my idea originally back in 2004 in Los Angeles when I was working at um, Air One Grocery and, it, and I was running an elixir bar there for my teacher, Ron Teagarden. Okay. And I started breaking open capsules and 
So mm -hmm. when when the Ganoderma coffee hit the network marketing circuits back 20 years ago, that was actually walking on on your discoveries. No, the Ganoderma, the Gano coffee stuff came out of out of China and out of Asia, primarily out of Indonesia. All right. Uh, but this mushroom coffee stuff that's recently come up with where they're putting, you know, like reishi and lion's mane and other stuff and in, uh, in, into like a into a kind of a, making a coffee substitute yeah. that was that westernized version of it was influenced by my work when i was at air one grocery and i created the first uh, reishi cap there in 2004 so i was calling it you know reishi cappuccino but uh somewhere along the line somebody cleverly decided to call it mushroom coffee and it kind of clicked that was recent yeah uh, but um no concept of the Gano coffee goes way back but that has coffee in it too that's yeah that's, yeah that's what yeah. i was thinking of i mean i recently picked up a bag of mushroom coffee which was yeah coffee drink with mushroom yeah. added right which i guess yeah. people, people who are into drinking coffee they don't mind it i i personally right. don't like coffee it makes me too jittery yeah well that's kind of why these are getting so popular particularly the ones that don't have coffee in them. Uh, I know the one you're talking about that is a mixture of coffee and, and reishi and lion's mane and some other herbs. Um, that was kind of falling off a little bit. Everybody's going for the ones that are, that, that harken more to my innovation, which was just using the mushrooms and herb, tonic herbs and making uh, like like drinks out of them. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is I'm looking that you have dandelion root powder in there. I'm remembering yeah. my grandfather drinking a coffee substitute that had dandelion root and chicory root in it roasted and it didn't yeah. taste anything like coffee but it was his morning drink he would yeah. he would take this plant root it was i think it was roasted it yeah. had roasted flavor to it and uh, so yeah. he would pour hot water on it and uh, yeah. I, I mean he put milk in it too to uh, to make it whatever he wanted it to taste like but it it definitely yeah. was his morning ritual to have this roasted root coffee substitute not coffee yes right that was called dandy blend it's been out for many many years uh, not a whole lot of people knew about it but you could even get that in regular grocery stores for quite a while and yeah. uh, it was dandelion three maybe one or two other ingredients yeah um and uh, and so when i was creating mine i wanted to have something that did replicate the effect of coffee like the little bit of that little edge you get with coffee and so i came up with the dandelion root as that component of it otherwise i would might not have bothered to put it in but i wanted to get that robust element you know yeah and uh, then i included uh rhodiola the adaptogen so yeah. basically what to do with with spiritino is to do in a good way what many people uh attempt to do with a cup of coffee in the morning and that is to get their alertness up get their energy up for their day. But when you take the adaptogenic herbs, for instance, in particular rhodiola, which I think is what we call the emperor herb in that formula, that herb is known to uh, it, 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 you know, get the adrenals going, but yet replenish them at the same time and fortify your circadian rhythms for the day so that you're ready to wind down at the end of the day and actually rest. So the next day you're back up and you're, you're running again. Then I added the mushroom reishi mushroom to bring it to, to have a peaceful sort of a, a day and i put in the lion's mane to bring it to the brain so we've got all our focus that we need yeah. and then i added the, the woo which is a nice you know anti-aging longevity tonic for the kidneys uh and uh, those are the primary elements in maca yeah there's maca there is maca yeah and there's monk fruits to make it taste nicer and there's a bit of cacao yeah. to uh, make it i mean i love the notes right now because it's it's I, my my most favorite mm. drink is actually a mochaccino, where it's hot chocolate, yeah. Yeah. hot coffee, and cream. That's what I was trying to get here. Yeah, yeah, you know something close to that. You did a great job. You know, like I I have had it a good number of times. I've put it into my smoothies. I've had it on my own. I mean, on its own. Yeah, it's it's a lovely, lovely creation. It really is. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. Um, it is it is going to help a person uh, accomplish what they want out of a cup of coffee, yet it's all good. 
replenishing the adrenals, providing your daily focus, helping you have a peaceful day, a, a good day of focus, getting a lot done. Come the evening, wind down, go to sleep. Right Rest, up. wake up, wake, you're awake again. Do it again. Yeah. All right. So that, that uh, describes it lovely in a, in a good way. How about this? You mentioned in passing the word Shilajit. We were talking about things mm -hmm. that are taken from extreme of nature. Shilajit yeah. is one of those things. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are two topics when it comes to Shilajit in my mind. One is the um, difficulty of getting the good stuff. And uh, the other is, of course, just describing what it really is. Because I have been selling humic acid and fulvic acid, which yeah. is readily available from the lower altitude and less mm -hmm. harsh environments. Yeah. And, it, and then they have their own benefits, pretty yes. valuable. So, uh -huh. but anyway, however you feel like jumping into it, uh, do you want to talk first about what it is, or, or do you want to talk about how hard it is to get? Uh, again, I'm glad we saved. <laughs> for the latter part of this uh, <coughs> a lot there's a lot in it um there's a lot to talk about there um Shilajit appears to be the humic remains uh the, of an entire ancient ecosystem uh depending on where it's uh collected from there there was an ecosystem there prior to possibly uh some people debate this but my feeling is that prior to the rising of the Himalayan mountains and the Altai mountains, where there was shield is primarily collected in those two mountain chains, which which neighbor each other. Um, prior to those mountains rising up, there was an, a, a complete rainforest there, like a, a very primitive ancient with water systems and peat bogs and humic acids already in those peat bogs uh, and fulvic acids and stuff. And then when the those those uh, continents collided and forced those mountains up, some of these uh, forests were rolled in and like entombed inside the rock. Yeah. And uh, humic acids, uh, which are the basic constituents of soil, uh, they are eternal. They they don't deteriorate. They don't die. They they can stay in an eternal state of preservation as long as they uh, are not metabolized. So if they're not, they don't touch water or so if they're they're kept away from the elements that cause them to metabolize, cause metabolic activity to occur, they will stay intact. And so this stuff which is locked in the rocks for billions of years. Um, a, a doc, a, a Indian doctor named Goshal did a lot of very interesting work on it where he was saying that um, it might be the tectonic activity of the seashells that are inside the rock from the from the ancient seabeds when the rocks were formed. And that 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 um, that um, scraping together of the old, of the ancient seashells, there's a nutrient release called it's a metabolite called dibenzo alpha pyrone, which is found in the ancient seashells of Precambrian animals, and it's the only traceable uh, metabolite to us. And that he thinks is something. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. <laughs> no, no, that's good. So, uh, I mean, two things to be said there. So we have this two things. One is pressure, right? So when the rocks pile on. It's compressing uh -huh. things. So you're just squeezing. So I don't know, maybe it was 10 meter or 10, 30 feet tall mm -hmm. or thick layer. And all of a sudden you mm -hmm. put rocks on it and it's just the pressure mm -hmm. will compress it. Right. And then the second mm -hmm. phase yeah. is the second phase is that it actually gets flipped and pushed up as those mm -hmm. uh, layers of rocks collide. Right. So not only is it Pressed, it's also up high in terrible elevations. Well, that's why I think it could be from ancient forests because why does it wind up up above 10,000 feet or 8,000 feet from like eight to 10,000 feet is where it's found. Why would it be way up? It would be up there because that's the first initial tectonic uh, pushing up uh, yeah. of that forest. So it winds up up high and it's, it's above the sedimentary rock formations. Right. So that's why it's there. It's a it's a very again I, I'm hypothesizing a little bit about this. Um, I did write a book on Shilaji that's not in print right now and get it back out uh, where I looked at all this. Um, but despite that, what what the more important part of the process uh, discussion is that Shilaji appears to be 
an agglomeration of that entire ecosystem, including all of its own detritus and its own human uh -huh. remains falling of leaves for millions of years. And it is a, is a combination of that. So every single element in nature is found in Shilajit. Every single element, the entire, all the 125 elements. Uh, and let's, let's just say why that is. So think about the word, hum humate or humus. Yeah. Uh, right. That, uh, it's the compost, right? The yeah. difference between beach sand and mm -hmm. fertile soil is the black stuff. Mm -hmm. You take mm -hmm. sand, you put the black stuff in, you now have a garden. Yes, and right. The black yeah. stuff is humus. It's the humic. And the humic acid got its name from the humus. Yes. And then, then that stuff, that is the black stuff, we're saying that's what got compressed and released, and that's what we're after. And the reason it has all those 125 elements is because the plants are concentrators. Plants that cause this black goo to become what it is had to have yeah. extracted into their own bodies all that which was in their environment, right? Plants are concentrators. They extract from the soil nutrients. And so then, yes. then, then they get composed, or not composed, decomposed by bacteria through composting. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the composting takes place, and then uh -huh. the pressure takes place on top of that, right? Yeah, well, uh, humic acids are the very smallest molecules in nature. So they form the very, very smallest minuscule root of soil. They're so small that other plants can take them up as nutrition. So they become the nutrients for, for the rest of the plants in the ecosystem. And uh, so the, once it's down to the humic acid level, it becomes the plant food for everything else. Uh, prior to that, it's larger molecules of, you know, carbon-based and mineral-based stuff. Um, but it's, it's the humic uh, acids become so easily bioavailable for us because they are the food for, for other organisms. Um, again, they're, like we were saying, we don't need to masticate and salivate and use a bunch of dipeptic enzymes to break this stuff down. It's just going to be going right into the bloodstream and uh, direct feeding all of these elements. You know, uh, we, we're, we're missing so many of the vital elements in our life today and our food. Uh, with the mechanized farming and, and the, you, you know, frankly, I mean, we shouldn't be growing one plant in a giant field. It should be a field full of a whole bunch of different plants growing together, right? right. And so, you mentioned, uh, yeah, you mentioned the tomato, but let's add to it corn, soy, wheat, potato. Those yeah. are the staples and they all are four month or six month plants. Yes, right. Um, they they just don't have the time to to uh, draw up any near the depth of what you find in something like uh, you know the, hum the humic acid components in soil and all that. Um, so she a very rare uh, thing, a uh, phenomenon in nature. And um, there's something that I, I'd like to say now to to your viewers about this. Shilajit should, should be treated with a lot of. Uh, reverence and uh and, and uh we should be very uh feel very fortunate if we have this in our lives and let me say that you don't need much of it so there isn't a whole lot out there in the world and suddenly shield is just so popular that people are just like bogarting this stuff thinking they're going to you know get all this benefit out of it uh, immortality in a tea on a teaspoon uh, taking a whole teaspoon of it the body can't even assimilate all that uh, like a little bitty pinky, like the size of your pinky nail is about all you need a day of this stuff. And then we allow the, the goodness to, you know, more people to, to get it. I, 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 I kind of shudder to think of us Westerners getting a hold of something like Shilaji and just, just usurping it all out of like vanity, you know, because we can afford it. You know what this reminds me of? The story of mm -hmm. olive oil. We know how many olive trees there are. We know how much olive oil could be grown. And there is about two and a half times as much olive oil sold on the planet as could physically be grown. Really? Yep. So where is the other coming from? Well, it's adulterated, right? Like it's mixed in with other things, right? Like you, yeah. you push in the other plant oil, safflower, God knows what they mix it with. Well, likewise, well, likewise with uh, the chilajit, you know, you need to really understand your source yeah. And can you trust it? Is it the real thing or is it 
you know, a wee bit of shilajit stretched out with something. I don't know. I mean, if I were stretching it, I would be stretching it with humic and fulvic, but God knows what somebody else may choose to stretch it with, right? Well, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think when you were talking earlier about like humic and fulvic acids from stuff like uh, dried peat bogs where it's powdered, something like that is great to mix with your shilajit to, to buffer it out. You know, those are still very valuable, uh, you know, full spectrum nutrients. And uh, that would be an ideal product in a sense. Um, but yes, on uh, on your earlier part of that statement, um, shilajit is probably being corrupted now because of the demand for it in the market and the, you know, the lack of availability, the scarcity of it is going to lead people to cut it. Um, I know I recently had to pull some shilajit that I had because we just, I just couldn't trust. I started looking into the sourcing and just didn't feel good about it and I had to pull it out and go back to another trusted source that I have. And they uh, mix the shilajit with trifala. So now I have a trifala blend of shilajit. But this now goes back to what we're saying because the traditional Ayurvedics knew that Shilajit was uh, almost too potent for us to ingest in it raw. So they traditionally mixed it with a blend of three herbs called Trifala. And that was the traditional Ayurvedic method of taking Shilajit. And so I have uh, adopted that process is in order to be uh, to follow tradition on one hand and also to spread the love and, and not be, you know, uh, totally usurping this and to help make sure I'm not corrupted product. Right on. So, which the three plants make the uh, thrifala? There's uh, there. It's called amala and and him himala and there's three. There are three fruits, three dried fruits that form. Uh, well, I don't have the names in front of me, okay. but it's it's a blend, and the Ayurvedics uh, had developed it over many many years. Yeah, if you can find that, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, Amla and Himala, and then uh, one is called uh, Trim tr tr Trimeta or something like that. Okay, well, I'll, the, okay, I'll just say it here. So Amala, which is Emblica officinalis, mm -hmm. Bibitaki, which is Terminalia bellirica, yeah, and Haritaki, which is Terminalia chebula. So there are two from the from the Terminalia genus, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's it. So they, the, the, the traditional, and, and I am a traditionalist uh, in my work in tonic herbalism. All my formulas are based on, uh, I've, I've modernized and been very careful to pay attention to tradition and, and, and all of the thousands of years that very wise people put stuff together for a reason. And in our modern world, I'm kind of like a feeling like, oh, my God, I, I just need to try and help people understand how to adhere to the traditional wisdom in this fast paced world that we have. But in India, they did. They they always uh, pretty much mixed it with Trifala to uh, th for three reasons. One is was to stretch out the, the availability of the Shilaji and their other is to uh, you know buffer its effects. And the other is that it, it turned out to be a very beneficial combination. Yeah. Uh, so I found a Trafala Shilaji that I have. And um, I, it's not like I'm trying to say to, to your viewers, hey, uh, just do mine or something. I am not saying that. But but I, but I if you go and look at all these people selling the resin, they're all, <laughs> a bunch of them go, the others are all fake and ours is the real one. <laughs> it makes you wonder like, well, which one is which, you know? Um, but I know my supplier I've been with for 20 years, um, and I just love this traditional blend. It's less expensive, too. Yeah. Well, what should be said is that so there are sources of it in, in the Himalayas. Yes. The Altai Mountains in Russia. It has a different name. Uh, I think it's called Mumio, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. very similar. And I remember... It getting Mumio back when back when I still lived in Europe, and it came yeah. in tiniest little pellets. They were yes. buckshot pellets. Yeah, that's probably the best way just to sell it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, that's the Russian word, Mumio. Yes. And they all, yeah, they've, they've been using it for many centuries too. Right. And then according, it trickled over into Bulgaria and further on over Croatia, Eastern yeah. Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, but I mean, I I understand that there's some stuff even in the Rocky Mountains in America, right? That's right. 
That's what they say. Uh, the Native Americans called it medicine rock. Uh, and I have a friend who is a purveyor of, of Rocky Mountain Shilajit in a, in a little dropper bottle. And um, I like it. It's, it tastes great. Uh, I have not looked at the domestic supply. I should be doing that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Wait, maybe, maybe you can do the American version of the uh, Ayurvedic thing. And instead of using Trifala, maybe we should go with peaches, cherries, and I don't know. We could. We, we really could. Uh, what you said earlier, just mixing it with other forms of uh, human uh, materials is, is yeah, also true. Uh, but then the whole thing is we'd, we would be honest saying, well, we've mixed it with these other human materials. Whereas we don't know these resins we're seeing. Uh, I just don't see where they, all of these purveyors are finding all this resin, you know, I'm having a hard time wondering where and what all what they're doing here, you know. Yep. Uh, it just made me a little bit concerned. Right. So we do have it available? Yes, I have a new, sh it's called, so the the traditional blend with with the Trifala is, is called Sheila Jith, with an H on the end, Sheila Jith. And that's what I have. I have a Sheila Jith blend in the, in the Trifala. All right. And uh, powder, it comes in uh, a little powder, you know, bag of the powder. Yeah. Well, it's a good, honest blend that will still kick up your ability to, well, it, it raises your mineralization, right? That's yes. Okay. Uh, and I really. It's blended, and it's blended with the fruits in such way that it's actually absorbable and absorbed. I mean, that's, I, I think that the reason why it's mixed that way is because it needs a carrier wave to arrive somehow rather than just blow through you if you take it concentrated. You're right. It needs a, quote, carrier. Yeah, that's the term for it, right, to help it assist its assimilation, full assimilation. Um, you know, I knew a guy when I was first uh, purveying Shilajit, and he said that you got to watch out because the monkeys uh, that they saw going up to the mountains to eat shilajit about way back thousands of years ago, that's how they discovered it. These monkeys would go up there to eat it in the spring and then the mountain goats. And they said these animals get on the ledge and they're eating the shilajit and they're, they're defecating there too. Uh, and then when people find the shilajit, they shovel it all up, including the dung and mix that all together. And I said, is that okay? And he goes, he goes, well, he goes, the thing is that that dung has been found to have, extremely high in the humic acids because the it was so it's so potent that the animal couldn't even absorb it also it's still a bunch of it in the, so then that made me think are all these people like just losing all this stuff and never even absorbing it it's going into the sewage system you know the chance a yeah, chance of that yeah. yeah all right well uh, you know these these bits of wisdom are hard earned <laughs> it takes decades and takes a lot of trying and uh, you know you're you're now um, well into your maturity you're not a uh, silly uh, buck who just tries to break the world in 3 days right you're you're now understanding yeah. that it takes time and patience and dedication and and there's no such thing as storming the gates of heaven you have to Take your time and earn it. Yeah. Um, when I first met Ron T. Garden, he told me that his teacher spent, uh, it took his teacher two years before he committed to teach Ron about the tonic herbs. And many years later, Ron asked him and said, why did it take you two years to open up about all this? And Master Park said, because the great masters who developed all this don't believe Westerners deserve this information because they will never seek to learn it at its deeper level. They'll just run with the surface value of it all. And I took that to heart. I really took that to heart. That was in 1998. And I said, I'm going to do what I can to help that not happen. You know, I mean, it's kind of inevitable in some ways because we do want things fast and easy. But just to be there, and I did my due diligence, yes, eight years silently with, with that master. And then also at um, Alhambra Medical College in Chinese Medicine, too, to, yes, to pay my dues, like you said, you know, uh, it's it's really important to to be able to be a purveyor of 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 the full picture, you know. Yep, and that's what I really appreciate about you is that you know you you've done the work and you the products the products are really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot.
Well, I appreciate that you've been so um, supportive of, of my my work and my products. I really appreciate that, Martin. Yeah. I, I Well, I'll try harder to introduce it to more people because oh, that's, yeah. that's how we'll stay in business and that's how we get to spread the message. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank I love you. It. This has been. I appreciate it. Buddy. Yeah. Thank you. This has been Ramania Dean Thomas, the uh, Chinese tonic herb master. Okay. You'll find Ramania's products here on Life Enthusiast under the RDT Herbs brand. And of course, in, in herbal categories and also found in various places because they will help your liver, your emotions, your heart, your this and that, whatever. It's, it's the tonic. Thank you, Romania. This is Martin at life-enthusiast.com. Thank you for being here today.